to introduce our first speaker, Laura Lewis from Caltech, who will speak about an improved machine learning algorithm for predicting ground state properties. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, yeah, so I'm Laura. I'll be talking about an improved machine learning algorithm for predicting ground state properties. And this is a joint work with Robert Huang, Viet Tran, Sebastian Lenner, Richard Kuhn, and John Preskill. Okay, so first to give some motivation, as you all probably know, finding ground states is a very fundamental problem in physics, and a lot of people care about really solving this problem. However, classical computers still struggle to solve this in general, so despite a lot of research going into efficient classical algorithms to find ground states or find properties of ground states, um, there haven't been many successes in finding yeah, an efficient one that works in general all the time. So then this raises the central question of this work, which is, can classical machine learning efficiently predict ground states after learning from some amount of training data? So this training data is essentially some examples of the algorithm is given beforehand. And the idea of machine learning then is, does being given these examples make the problem easier somehow? Like being able to just generalize from the examples rather than solving it from scratch. So to go over the, uh, the basics of classical machine learning, the goal is usually you want to learn some unknown function, so I'll denote this function as C, and it just maps from any input space X to an output space Y. And in order to learn this function, you're given some amount of training data. So this training data usually comes in pairs. So the pairs here I label as XL and YL, where XL are just some inputs sampled from a distribution D over the input space X. And the YLs are the corresponding outputs for this XL. So they're those functions C that we want to learn evaluated at this XL. And sometimes this doesn't have to be exact. It can also be approximate. And the metric by which we evaluate how well we've learned this unknown function C is by this low average prediction error. So here we have this, this expectation. And it's evaluated over new samples of X. So we sample some new X that's not part of the training data. And we sample it from the same distribution D that the training data was sampled from. And then we evaluate H star, our hypothesis function it's usually called. We evaluate that on X and see how far away that was from what the actual target function C on X should have been. And so we want this low average prediction error to be small. And the point of this is that we want to do this with as little training data as possible. So this, this capital N here, which is the number of pairs that we get, that should be very small. And so this N is called the sample complexity. So what about in our setting? How does it translate? So in our setting, we consider some Hamiltonian that's on N qubits, and it's geometrically local and gapped. And it can be written as a sum of these interaction terms. So each of these HJ are local, geometrically local terms. And by geometrically local here, I mean local in the sense that they only act on few qubits. And geometrically local means that these qubits also have to be nearby by some distance metric. So you can think of the qubits on some, some lattice, and then you use a standard distance to say they're, they're nearby. And what we do in this work is we parameterize h by some vector x. So x here can take any value from negative 1 to 1. It's an m-dimensional vector. And I'll usually refer to this vector as the, the parameter vectors or just the parameters of the Hamiltonian. So writing this parameterization, we can say, oh, just write h of x and have it as a sum of each of these local terms, hj of x. So each of these local terms now depends on this parameter vector x. So what you can think of h of x is it's just a map that takes this, this vector and maps it to a matrix. So just a very simple example here. Suppose we have um, x is just a two-dimensional vector, so it just has two entries, x1 and x2, uh, in each of these local terms. One of them is x1, z1, and the other local term is x2, z2. So something simple like that. Okay, so let's rewrite the setting up here. So we say that the Hamiltonian should be parameterized smoothly by this vector x. And throughout the rest of the talk, I'll use rho of x as the ground state of h of x. Okay. Just throughout, anytime you see a rho of x, it should be the ground state. 
And the goal here, the target function, the C that I put on the previous, uh, previous slides about machine learning, are these ground state properties. And the way I define a ground state property is trace O, rho of x, where again, rho of x is this ground state of the Hamiltonian H of x, and O is a sum of geometrically local observables. Can you assume the of a ground state? Sorry? Can you assume the of a ground state? Um, I, think, I think we don't really need it. I think we need just some ground state that we need to predict properties of. Properties change in the ground space than any prediction is good? I think it might just be easier to consider units of the ground state. Yeah, it is easier. I think I thought it might still work. But, anyways, we want to predict these, these ground state properties where O is a sum of geometrical observables and we have a spectrum more bounded by one. And the training data that we're given here is pairs, again, XL and YL, but this time XL is sampled from some distribution, again, D, over this parameter space. And YL approximates the ground state property. Okay, so I've just written that up again here. And so the overall goal, again, is that we want to input this parameter to our classical machine learning algorithm, and then it outputs some approximation of our ground state property. Another similar, oh, actually, so the main question then is, can classical ML do this efficiently? So that's what I was saying earlier about, can classical ML predict ground state properties after learning from some amount of training data? But there's a similar problem, which is, yeah, very related, which is predicting ground state representation. Yes, I don't know. The training data is on some fixed local observables, or they should not change? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's the key distinction between this and what I was going to say on the next slide. So here we have um, yeah, the more general goal of predicting ground state representations. So instead of given the YL, which is for yeah, fixed observable this ground state property, then say YL just approximates the ground state. So it's just a classical shadow representation of the ground state. And if we're given this instead, essentially, yeah, the question then becomes, instead if we're given this parameter, these parameters, we want to feed it into our classical ML algorithm, and then we output a classical representation of the ground state instead. And again, the question then is, can classical ML do this efficiently? And as Abhinav was saying, this is, more, this is more general, because then if we have a ground state representation, what we can do is plug in like any observable and predict ground state properties. So we also care about this question. Yeah. Did you say what, what is a classical shadow representation of the ground state? Yeah, so classical shadow representation would be, so you prepare like the ground state in the lab or something, and then you perform a bunch of randomized measurements and you collect the results of these measurements. This is polynomial size? <laughs> yeah, it's like a sustained classical representation. When you say this is uh, parameters to describing a physical Hamilton, do you have actually a specific realization in mind? Because if I build a material, right, it's a one shot, I can't really sample X from my distribution. So you, um, you need a high degree of tunability, I think, to get that sampling on your X's and parameters. Yeah, I think we, we do want, um, yeah, we expect like the number of parameters should scale with like the number of qubits, I think. But do you have a specific physical system in mind for which this would be? Um, just so, um, not like one in one in particular, just one that yeah can be parameterized. Like, um, like in the numerical experiments, we do use like the two D random Heisenberg model, but it's not only for this uh, this model. It's just any so is any Hamiltonian can be parameterized. Like this. I, I suppose it helps that these an arbitrary distribution. So to the extent that you're tunable, you know, maybe a very skewed distribution. Isn't that the, <laughs> Can you do you also look for symmetries like causational symmetry or does that make your task simpler or harder? Um, we don't make any of these assumptions. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about it. The problem is it may simplify the it may get a better sample complexity if you assume these things, but we're trying to deal with the yeah most general possible. Yeah, and so the question of can classical ML do this efficiently was answered in a previous work by Robert and collaborators. 
which shows that there does indeed exist an efficient classical machine learning algorithm. So I denote this as the G star here that achieves this low average prediction error. So there are a few things I'd like to point out about this result, which is first notice the, the training data size. So it scales as n to the order one over epsilon, where n is the number of qubits and epsilon is this average prediction error. But for a fixed constant epsilon, you want the prediction error to be very small. Then this polynomial really blows up. It gets really, really big. And this isn't so great in practice. So in theory, this is a polynomial. So for yeah, theoretical computer scientists, all we really care about is that it's a polynomial. But if we want to implement these algorithms in practice to actually learn these ground state properties um, and use them, then this is very infeasible. So we'd have to collect like a lot of training data in order to actually run this algorithm. And that raises the central question of this work, which is, can we do better than this n to the order one over epsilon amount of training data? And there's another thing I wanted to point out about this algorithm, which is this expectation here. Notice that the uh, parameters here are sampled from a uniform distribution over the parameter space. Okay, so they're not sampled from an arbitrary distribution. So this is another limitation of this algorithm. And in this work, we improve on both of those. But in order to do so, we need a key additional assumption. So before the previous work actually showed a sample complexity lower bound. So with just the assumptions that I stated before, just we have some h of x that can be written as a sum of local terms, then that polynomial, that n to the order one over epsilon was the best that you can do. So we have to add this additional assumption, but it's a fairly natural one. And what it is is that h of x can be written as, again, the sum of these hj, but now each of these hj only depend on a constant number of parameters. And that's what I'm denoting as this vector x sub j. Okay, so before, hj could depend on the entire parameter vector x at once, like all m parameters. But here I'm only saying that uh, it has some more local structure, which is that each of these local terms only depend on a few of them at a time. And this is really a key that I'll refer back to many times. And so in this work, we prove the following rigorous guarantee, which is that there exists a classical machine learning model, H star, that achieves this low average prediction error when the trained data sampled from any arbitrary distribution. So that's improvement over the uniform case from before. And moreover, the training data scales as log n times two to the polylog one over epsilon. So when we consider, again, a fixed constant epsilon, then this scales as just logarithmically an n, whereas previously it was a very high degree polynomial. So this is an exponential improvement over the best known algorithm for doing this. Any just any, any distribution over the... Yeah, I think that this... This is still fine. It's as long as. Um, so, so it works for one So it works for all points. I mean, that's my question, right? I and mean, imagine a distribution which is only non zero and a single vector. vector. That means I don't need expectation. The issue is that your training data and what you're tested on is the oh, same distribution. Ah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this D is the same for what your training data sampled on and what you're tested on. Um, yeah, and so again, emphasizing this exponential improvement over the previous algorithm when considering just the scaling in terms of n. But when you also consider the scaling in terms of 1 over epsilon, we have an improvement there as well. So before it was exponential in 1 over epsilon, but now we've improved this to only quasi polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Sorry. Uh, do you know this is of this standard like, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. The smooth, uh, so we assume that the Hamiltonian H of X is parameterized smoothly by the vector. Okay, so this is our, our main theorem, but we also obtain a corollary uh, just as the second question that I stated about learning ground state representations. So this is fairly simple, it follows directly from like the classical shadow formalism combined with the previous theorem. And all that says is just like before, if we're instead given the labels YL as classical shadow data, sample from, again, any arbitrary distribution, we can learn a ground state representation instead that can predict, um, well, for any observable O. So here, I guess, by any observable O, I do mean that has to be the sum of geometric local observables with spectral norm bounded by one, um, just as we assumed. But yeah, I can do this for, for any observable satisfying those conditions. 
using the same amount of training data. Okay, so this is again more powerful than the previous theorem I just showed because for the previous theorem, then we had to have a fixed O. So we would have to generate the training data only for this one O, then run the machine learning algorithm and do this. And if we want to predict a different ground state property corresponding to a different observable O, we would have to retrain the model, regenerate all the training data and everything. So this is a more powerful tool. Excuse me. Did they ever take a square? Actually, of the expectation point, that's not a natural thing to do for the quantum system. Yeah, I guess so this. Uh, you mean the square here? Yes. Yeah, it's a fairly natural like um, evaluation metric in machine learning. But not important. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. This is more standard in like machine learning metric. Natural because it's actually natural, or because you can prove things that otherwise you can't. Yeah, because you can prove things, and it's very like standardly used. The reason is not that it's natural, but that then you can calculate things. Yeah, yeah. I guess I meant like natural in the sense that most people use. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not but physically I think natural. It's an important distinction, right? Some mm -hmm. people just use not very natural things just because I'm very happy. Yeah, and so we have this proposition. Moreover, this is basically just a corollary from the previous work. But what it says is that assuming some complexity theoretic assumptions, namely RP is not equal to NP, which means uh, no randomized polynomial time algorithm should be able to solve NP complete problems. Then for even just 2D Hamiltonians, no randomized classical algorithm that predicts even just one body observables should be able to achieve an average prediction error that's small with polynomial time. So all that this proposition is just saying is that this problem for non-learning algorithms should be very hard. You shouldn't be able to predict these ground state properties. But this shows the power of the machine learning algorithm, which when we're given this training data, it allows it to overcome this result. Sorry, do you trust the data, right? Sorry? Trust the learning data. Yes, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so this is, this is a result about non-learning algorithms. Okay. So, excuse me, so, so how does all of this depend on the quality and need of your samples? If your samples are already kind of epsilon precise and all this, how does that affect? Yeah, so in in these results, then, um, oh, I guess I didn't say it. Uh, I said it here. Yeah, that each of the YLs only approximates this ground state property here. So um, this is up to like an additive epsilon error. So we already have this. And it only gets better if it's exactly equal. But how precise does it have to be such that the ones that you write down are still valid? Yeah, so it has to be within epsilon. So it's the same epsilon. Oh, the same one. Yeah, okay. the same epsilon here. So does this have any implication on solving NP-hard problems? Like if I have a distribution which say in most instances are NP-hard, I solve a certain fraction of them, I solve one of them basically? Um, no, no, so this, what this is saying is that no randomized classical algorithm does not learn from data. So yeah, this is just- that, Let's imagine, I mean, I'm not talking about that, but the implication if you use a machine learning, right? So, so mm -hmm. I, I have a distribution which well, say most instances are hard, I train it on a certain fraction of data, then I can solve all the instances using that data. So can I kind of compress the task of solving NPR problems? Um, I only have to solve less, less of those to solve one of them? Uh, I guess, so you'd still have to be given like the, the training data from solving. Sure. From the I, mean, I mean, you know, I'm not saying I'm solving NPR problems efficiently, but I'm saying instead of solving a million, I can solve a thousand, and then I solve most of them. Is that correct? Is that um, is that surprising or not? It's not surprising or it's not correct? No, you know, so, well, one NP hardness is a worst case notion. So you can talk about average NP, but that, that's not that's yeah, not, but that's not I a big guess one has by distribution for many instances. So, are yeah, but then but then also when once you're in the learning setting, you're you're getting, you know, you're being tested on the same distribution on which you saw answers. And so it's a it's a totally different setting. It's well studied. I mean this. This and notion of learning is well studied and it doesn't have. Right. Um, Imagine you have a distribution where most instances are hard, right? And then I, this tells me I solve a certain fraction of them, which is relatively small, and then I can actually solve most of them after I solve this one fraction. Well, but then, you know, if you set up a problem that way, then there won't be a learning algorithm. But that's a very general theorem, I understood, for any kind of distribution, right? It's related to things like easy dimension of what you're trying to learn and so on. Okay. Something called VC dimension. Okay. So that dictates usually in classical learning model examples. So 
if you have a hard problem, that might be very big. But that's it. Okay, in fact, there is another way that we're at. Okay, what if I take, I can, I can take a very large N, I go to the sat density right at the phase transition point, okay, where we think it is, I add a little epsilon error bar, and I just take my sample set from there, right, right where the frustration-free to frustrated phase transition is, okay, for people in physics. Why can't I just generate my data set from that? So, 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 sorry, this is very dependent on the on the actual uh, task at hand. So I think this is a task where you can do the learning efficiently. Not all not all learning tasks can be solved efficiently, right? So, so the fact that this one can is a you know every time you find a learning task for which there's an efficient algorithm, that's a that's a moment to celebrate. Uh, uh, for more for most tasks, you know, you'd be in the situation that you described where where uh, there's no efficient learning out there. Also, you have to observe this to be solved here. I think this is about camera. I think this condition that, that you get to see random samples from the same distribution that you'll be tested on different kind of uh, kind of question than than just just being given an instance, even if it's a random. No, I, I'm not saying this solves any problem sufficiently. Just is that you can reduce a bit. It will be still by quite a bit in the yeah. sense that you know you only have to solve like one percent of all the problems, and you solve all of them. So solve them more than one. And it would be exponential, but only if you want to solve all instances. Really. So but I, I, I'm just I don't know. Is it a misunderstanding or is it unsurprising that there is this fact? Well, maybe it's many IT problems to less. I mean, this is kind of the definition of average case hotness, right? It's like, like if something is like average case NP hot, then you can reduce NP hot problems to, to like an, an average instance, right? And so you only have to solve a small fraction. Um, but this is not true of NP that, that we know. Right? I think so, that question is a different one. It's not about a single instance. Right? It's, it's, well, can I can I compute things and then make make the solution of the follow up following NP problems much simpler? So, so yeah. maybe, maybe no, no, but since since um, since you have strong intuition about this, you know, at the end of the talk, you you tell us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the good discussion. Uh, okay, um, yeah. So this is pretty much the setup and the main results. So now I'll talk about the ML algorithm in particular, and then I'll go over the the proof ideas later, and uh, some of the numerical experiments. So a key part of the machine learning algorithm, and really the, the non-trivial part, is that some feature mapping. So we take the input space, and we map it to a higher dimensional space called the feature space. And we do this with this vector, or sorry, this mapping phi. So I won't specify exactly what this like m sub phi is for now. Um, and it's not too important. All that matters is that it's much bigger than m. Okay, so we initially take these parameters. So this, this represents, again, our parameter vector x. And what I said was the key additional assumption here was that each local term of the Hamiltonian only depends on a small constant subset of the whole parameter vector. So only a few parameters matter. So let's highlight each of these little regions of parameters. And what we do in the feature mapping, so this is just a very high-level sketch at first, what we do is we take each of these local regions and we um, create a small vector for each of those regions. So we're encoding this like local structure of the Hamiltonian into the feature mapping. And then what we do is we concatenate all of these smaller vectors together to form this one larger one, and that is our feature vector. Okay, so what is the actual details of how we implement this? So first we write our observable O corresponding to the ground state property we want to predict in the Pauli basis. So I said that O was the sum of geometrically local observables, and so we can write each of those geometrically local observables in terms of Pauli's. So each of these Pauli's here should 
only be non-identity on a few nearby qubits. And what we do is for each poly, we define some map, chi p of x, that sets parameters in x that are far away from p to zero. And by far away from p, what I mean by this is the following picture. So this is a little hard to see, but here we have a 2D lattice. I'm just considering for simplicity of our qubits. And yeah, this part is a little hard to see, but there should be little lines between the, the qubits, which indicate these local terms of the Hamiltonian. So they're all just two body nearest neighbor. And suppose we have some poly in this decomposition that acts on only these three qubits. And the way that we define this like farness from P is we consider some neighborhood around this poly. So just within some sufficiently small neighborhood. So it includes this qubit now. And we look at the local terms that act on qubits only contained in this region. So namely, these are these local terms that I labeled H14, 19, 20, and 25. And what we do is each of those local terms depends on some parameters. So I'm saying these is like the X14, X19, 20, and 25 here. So those, these are just the parameters that each of these local terms depend on. <coughs> And what I'm saying by this is that these are the only ones that matter. Only within this region, those parameters should be the only ones that affect the ground state property. And so we set the rest of them to zero. Okay, so that's what this map chi p of x does. This is kind of isolating each of these local regions and saying that we can consider each of them at a time for a certain poly. And then what we do is we discretize the range of chi p of x. So by the range of chi p of x, I just mean the, again, the parameters, but with the parameters set um, to zero when they're far from p. So we discretize this. And when we discretize this, then we just consider a sufficiently fine lattice of points. So here we have each of these, each of these points. And all that we're doing is we draw a box around each of these points. And for all of the vectors in this box, then we map them all to their representative lattice point. Okay, so for example, in this box, we're mapping them all to x prime. I'm going to call this box just some, some set of vectors as t, and it depends on x prime and p. Yeah. Wait, what, uh, the map chi p of x is from what to what? I understand x, what's the range? Yeah, so chi, chi p of x should, um, I guess in general, it should be for mapping like n-dimensional, like negative one to one to the m, um, to that same thing. But then we're just setting certain parameters to zero within that. Yeah. So by the range, I really just mean like not all parameter vectors, but already we've set some to zero. Yeah. So it's a fairly standard discretization, and we consider this this set of vectors that should be represented by the lattice point x prime, and it depends on p because we're doing this for each poly. And what the feature mapping does then is it just effectively maps x to its nearest lattice point. Okay, so here again, we're considering this local region. And again, because of this map chi p of x, then we can just consider one local region at a time. And when we consider that local region, we have this feature map or sorry, we have this feature vector for that specific poly p. And each entry in the feature vector is just a zero or a one. And namely, it's a one if uh, the x should be in tx prime p. So each entry in this vector corresponds to a specific lattice point, so a specific x prime. And we just put a one if the feature mapping um, input x should map to that x prime. So when you set parameters to zero, it means you set the corresponding to the parameters to zero? Um, no, we set, so, yes, yeah, so it's like... Zero doesn't seem special, that's why I'm asking, right? Because you just said h depends on x in some way, but you didn't specify it. Yeah, I guess, I guess the way, um, I guess what's important about the algorithm is that it doesn't depend on how h is parameterized. Okay. So, sorry, so you're kind of taking a Hamiltonian, then you have a 
binary variables and you put it in front of each term and then you're sampling from a distribution of that binary, uh, binary variables. And so they're not binary. Oh, they're not they're, binary. They go from anywhere from negative one to one. Oh, anywhere between negative one and one. Okay, yeah. that's a lot different. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. They're centered around zero, or it just depends on the distribution. Like how how is the distribution that you're you know you're sampling from? What's it look like? An example of these variables around it's a Gaussian, it's a normal distribution. Yeah, it's any, any distribution. Right. Choose one, which is not supported on zero lines, and the set next to zero. Yeah, so this is the difference between like where the training data is sampled from and uh, like what we're doing. Okay, so the proof still applies in that case. So, so this is the feature mapping. So it's just yeah, a vector of zeros and ones. And yes, yeah, so this is just a summary. So first we map again the parameter space to this higher dimensional feature space using this feature mapping that encodes the locality of the Hamiltonian. And then what we do is we just use some fairly standard machine learning techniques. Namely, we're using this L1 regularized regression or the lasso algorithm over the feature space. So what lasso does is it learns linear functions so here, this w vector is just a vector of coefficients. And phi of x, remember, is our feature vector. And so lasso is a fairly yeah, standard algorithm in machine learning that learns linear functions under the constraint that this vector of coefficients, w, must be have one norm bounded above by some b. And this b is a hyperparameter that we set in the learning algorithm. And there Yes, yeah, so th that's actually a really good point. Um, yeah, so we assume that the ground state, or we don't assume, we prove that the ground state property can be approximated by a linear function. So that's not an input, that's an output. Yes. So, so h of x is, um, is what the machine learning algorithm outputs, saying that it should approximate the ground state property. Oh, that's not the Hamiltonian. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, okay, yeah, that, that is very confusing, yes. Yes, yeah, I should have used a different letter for this, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so this is the hypothesis function that the machine learning algorithm is out for. Yes. Yeah, so in the proof, one of the, the key step is showing that actually this ground state property does approximate, uh, is approximated by a linear function over the feature space. Yeah. So for the regular scan, here you want B to be bounded above by constant or something? Uh, it doesn't have to be bounded above by constant. In fact, the B that we have is to the polylog 1 over epsilon. Or I guess that, that's what I guess you should know. It. Yes, yeah. So this is something that you set because for these regular scaring keys, um, so yeah, lasso is something, one of the machine learning algorithms that we know has yeah, very rigorous guarantees on the sample complexity that depend on how we set this B. So roughly for our case, actually, very roughly, um, here we have this prediction error. And one well known result is that you can bound it above by the training error. So this training error is how we did on the, the samples that were already given. And it's plus b squared, so this is the same b, times the square root of log of the, the feature space dimension over the sample complexity. So it depends on yeah, how large this feature, um, feature space is and also the one arm of the so if you have non-constant dependence on the parameters, does this feature space scale exponentially with that? Um, okay. so, the, so the key here is that this feature space scales with n, so, or some of it scales with n. Um, and so that's how we get the log n dependence. So the size of the feature space should have some scaling in terms of the system size, like little n, I mean, um, the number of qubits. And so then when we solve this to get a low prediction error, then this uh, sample complexity we can see has a log of So it doesn't depend on the constant. Like if you move from constant to log regime, does it have an impact on the scale? Do you mean the B? Dependency on the parameters, the local dependence. Uh, so do you the M? M uh, are, are, you, are you saying uh, the parameters were chosen between minus one and one? Yes. If you choose them yes. between, yes. make them a larger. Oh, I think you could you could scale them down to be within this range. So I think the only the only thing that matters here is the um, like the number the number of parameters. So, so it's like m. So the little m 
because we map that to this n sub phi. So I think we, we do assume is that the number of parameters, like this little m that I had before, is like order little n. So order uh, on the order of the number of people. Yeah, so it's very, very roughly what Lasso gives us. And it's well-known result. So that's what we use to get the sample complexity. So again, overall, the idea of the learning algorithm is, again, we're given these parameters x, and then we, we make our feature vector, we run lasso, and then we can predict ground state properties. So now I'll talk about the, the ideas behind the proof. So again, just giving what we want to prove. So this is the, the main theorem. And remember, the, the key is that we can sample from any arbitrary distribution as opposed to uniform, like from before. And this exponential improvement when considering the scaling in terms of system size. So before, remember, this was this n to the order 1 over epsilon. But here we have this log n scaling. And moreover, something that maybe I should have mentioned before is that both of these algorithms require a computational time that scales in little n, the number of qubits, times capital N, the sample complexity. And so by obtaining this, this improvement in the sample complexity, we automatically get a better computational time as well. So just explicitly, the best previous algorithm had computational time and sample complexity that both scaled as very, very large polynomials uh, when considering a constant prediction error. But our result shows that, again, for this constant prediction error, then our sample complexity scales as only log n, and the computational scale time scales as n log n. Sorry to ask this now, maybe you didn't say it earlier. How is O regularized? Is there a bound on its norm? And what is that bound? Yeah, so the, the um, spectral norm of O is bounded by one. By what? Yeah. And <coughs> also the sum of geometrically local terms. That might, of course, kill the MP okay. So the proof follows three main parts, and the first part is probably the most involved. And the first part is showing the, the simpler form for a ground state property. So this is what I was talking about before, about the ground state property can actually be predicted or approximated by linear function over the feature space. So the particular w prime here. And so the way that we show this is we first show that trace o rho of x can be approximated by some function, f of x, which is the sum of a bunch of smooth local functions. And I'll talk more about what those are specifically. Uh, and then we prove that each uh, that this f of x can be approximated by this linear function over the feature space. And then by triangle inequality, we just get uh, this final result. Okay, so how do we show this? This is really just comes back to the way that I define the feature vector and comes back to this picture. So remember what I was saying with this picture was that all of the parameters outside of this neighborhood of this Pali P don't matter and we set them all to zero. And so the key part of this proof is really showing that this indeed doesn't matter. So showing that if we set every parameter outside of this neighborhood to zero, then the ground state property is not affected much by this. That's really the key idea underlying this. So to formalize it a little more, we again write O in, in the Pali basis. And it suffices to show here that alpha p, so this is the Pauli coefficient here, times trace p rho of x is approximated by some fp of x. So this is exactly the smooth local function that I was saying f is the sum of. So we can see that it suffices to show this just because if we sum on both sides of rho of polys, then this turns into trace o rho of x, and this right side turns into f of x. So f of x is exactly the sum of these fp of x. And how is fp of x defined? Well, it's actually just the ground state property uh, that we want that we want to predict for this specific Pali p, but where the parameters for the ground state are set to zero for if they're far from p. So then, what we want to show really just comes down to a statement of yeah, what I was saying before about only the parameters that are close to p affect the ground state property. So if we change things outside. They don't matter, and we set them to zero. So to prove this, we use two main tools. One is the spectral flow formalism, 
and the other is Lieb Robinson bound. So the spectral flow formalism gives an expression for the directional derivative of a ground state. And in particular, it gives a bound on the directional derivative of the ground state. And so what we do is we look at this directional derivative in the direction where we're changing parameters that are far away from P. And so by this bound, then we can show this, the change of the ground state when we're changing the parameters far away from P is very small. And so that's where we're using. Yeah. So what about, again, sorry to come back to my data distribution, which I can't change continuously. Because again, for NDR problems, that's not true. Or if I change a spin far away, things will change a lot. Right? The spins are kind of rigid and rigid constraints that affect each other. Yeah, so I guess but this um, this doesn't have much to do with the distribution because we're not, uh, this isn't like training data that's given to it. This is just something like in the proof. This is saying like this, yeah, this doesn't have much to do with the actual learning algorithm. It's just a result saying that for this class of Hamiltonians that we're considering, then you can approximate the ground state property by a linear function over the feature space. That's the NPR problem, right? If I, if I change all couplings to one spin, if I, I mean, things will be correlated globally, right? It's not true that if I change them here, it will not affect spin somewhere else in the ground state. But it's indeed a big change I have to do overall. I think there's a gap here, so it's... It is a gap. Yeah. It's a classical spin glass, right? If you get classical I, Ising model is coupled to plus I, I, I was going to ask, actually, but... Um, Sorry? Like, um, actually, I'm hoping this question clarifies this issue, but the, are, are you assuming that there's a adiabatic path um, between this original Hamiltonian and all, all the instances that you're considering? Like, uh, um, I don't think they would have to... So, like, they could be just... Um, so different instances, they can be all gap, but they, they may not have any, there may not be any, like, be a bad path between them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, okay, so, so you say, forget the distribution, you impose it on this whole integral minus one, one to the M, the Hamiltonian is gap throughout. So if I understand correctly, I think yeah. the assumption is that the Hamiltonian is gap in the whole parameter domain. Independent of the distribution. Right, like mm -hmm. the, like whatever parameter you input into the Hamiltonian, if the parameter takes value from minus one to one, then you should get the Hamiltonian so that everything is like continuously changing. Okay, okay, that, that consists, I guess. Yes. But that's not realistic. Sorry? That's not realistic. There will be phase conditions. But uh, it's a small, small enough neighborhood, yeah, then it will be a small realistic. But yes. I, I think actually my error, my error in judgment was actually that. I'm intuitively thinking about non-statistically representative instances, and I, I think that's the actual confusion. Right? Most of what we're saying is not going to be statistically representative. So most of the questions, I believe that's the issue. So, so, so and about the spectral flow theory, what are the assumptions that you need such that this works, actually, for the spectral flow theory? Yeah, I think there are a bunch of, like, I, there are a bunch of technical assumptions. I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. But we, we save them in the like appendices. I forget what exactly it is, but the Hamiltonians that we consider do, do satisfy. Is, is, is it there that's an assumption that it's gapped on all this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the gapped assumption. Yeah. For BMNS, I don't know the space. Sorry? I don't know that BMNS. Oh, yes. Uh, Bachman. Um, I forget Spiros is last name. Right. And then, Spiros, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so we use yeah, spectral flow formalism again just to bound this uh, directional derivative. And at some point we come up with a bunch of integrals that um, need also leave Robinson bounds. So this is like a very non-trivial part of the paper. It's I think it's like 30 pages in the appendix or something. Um, but yeah, this is the main intuition behind it. Okay. And the same theorem, we just need to show that each of these functions, f of x, can be approximated by some linear function over the feature space. And what this really comes from is by definition of the feature vector. So remember, the feature vector was just a, a vector of like indicator functions. And so all that we're doing is we're approximating a smooth local function by a sum of indicator functions. And that's something that, that can be done. So remember, this was um, how we define the feature ma mapping and where each of the entries in the feature vector were just these, uh, an indicator function over this set. Yeah? Uh, so I'm not sure if I understand this. Um, so 
Um, I want to understand. So I understand that this is very deep uh, theory, the spectral form, uh, formalism. But I want to understand roughly if you can give some intuition about some locality properties of the of the ground state that, that it applies to. Um, so in some sense, basically, basically this this works for only in cases where the ground states are not affected by edge cases, right? That they're only affected by small, by local properties of the of the hematoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Is I that think roughly. Yeah, yeah I think it's roughly. safe to say that. Um, yeah, spectral flow also could hold like for the Hamiltonians mm -hmm. that were just the sum of like these local terms um, without our like new assumption about. Uh, each local term only depends on the certain kind of structural flow still holds. Sorry, but we, we do know. Did you just say that, that it's enough to, to restrict to local Hamiltonians or, or? Yeah, it's enough to say, like, uh, yeah, so I guess what I was saying was uh, it also, spectral flow and Lee Robinson bounds and things were also applied for like Robert's previous work. So it's not something that's like, um, it's not something that we can now apply with the additional assumption we add for our work. But yeah, your, your understanding of when we can apply special flow is fine. I think I just wanted, I just wanted to clarify with the, um, yeah, I guess what I was saying was, uh, what that? Like this, that this is not something um, that we need for special flow. Like the, um, this HJ depends on a constant number. That's what I wanted to just clarify when I gave my answer. Mm -hmm. You really want to understand what the assumptions are of your, of your theorem. So, so does it, do you allow for level crossing? So, so do you understand that? Do you not allow for level crossing at all? If you value these values? Uh, what do you mean by level crossing? Well, if you change a few of these values, that suddenly there will be an exciting state that goes around state and, and level crossings or phase conditions. You don't allow for any of those? I don't think we allow for phase. That's not the I think it's still, it's, I think it's still worth. It's works. just learning a gapped phase. I think that's all that's going on. You yes. have to learn a gapped phase, and that's all you're learning. You can't learn a gapped phase. You can have a gapped phase with so just, many parameters. Just be in deep in, a, a few parameters. Just be deep in a phase process. and make the distribution small. It's, it's plausible. It, it, it may not be interesting from the phase transitions viewpoint, but it still makes sense as a. A I take a model and put small magnetic fields between tensors and minus tensors on the spider. I think you guys are both right. You're learning one state, basically. It's like, <laughs> fair enough. It's not fair at all. But it, look, the, the, the counterexamples are statistically very non likely, right? So the statistical, you know, on the, the distribution itself, you're asking for things that are very, very unlikely inside that distribution, I believe. This is my understanding, which would kind of sew it together, right? So not non-representative instance is very, very rare inside your distribution. Most of the things are happening. Is that, is that issue? I think what they're saying is that um, you would need, like, yeah, you can't predict the cross-phase transitions. That's that's true. Um, yeah, that's also something that was in the previous work. So it's not something that we get out of our additional assumption. It's not like it's weakening. It's weakening. Um, yeah, but I think what they found in like numerical experiments is that even if you did try to predict across grade transition, transitions, it still works fairly well. It's just that we don't have the rigorous guarantee. And why isn't that you don't have that rigorous guarantee? Is because of how the distribution behaves? No, the spectral flow breaks down. It's, it's not the distribution, it's you can't go smoothly in the spectrum. Yeah, we need, we need the gap um, over like the whole. Yeah, yeah, we need like a gap phase for the spectrum. Okay. I mean, a spin glass will have a constant gap, right? Mm -hmm. the, the cost is yeah. Sorry, so what? Yeah, it doesn't, I don't think it has to do with the like distribution here. This is more something for a spectral flow, which doesn't have anything to do with the distribution. Yeah, maybe we can talk about it. Um, yeah, so this is the, the thing I thought we showed at the end. Um, 
So remember, the previous part really just was using like approximation of these smooth local functions. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess actually something I should point out about this is that we, in practice, we don't actually have to use these uh, this feature mapping of like indicator functions. All that we needed here was really that we're approximating uh, these smooth local functions. So for the numerical experiments, in fact, we don't use this one. We use a Fourier feature, which is something that we don't have rigorous guarantee on, but we expect a similar one will hold, but the analysis will just be like much more difficult. Yeah, the indicator functions are something, yeah, not really used in practice, but give you a, um, a nice rigorous guarantee. So the second part of the proof is this norm inequality. So as I was saying before, the efficiency of this L1 regularized regression, or lasso, depends greatly on the L1 norm of the coefficient vector w. So remember that uh, in lasso, then we find some linear hypothesis with respect to the constraint that the one norm of w is bounded above by some b. So we need to choose this b. And the way we choose it is um, important because if we choose this regularization, regularization hyperparameter b such that the one norm of w prime is bounded above by b, then this will guarantee that whatever w star was found by lasso, this could grip very greatly from what w prime was, then standard learning theory just gives us that whatever w star is indeed found will yield a small training error. So this is how we choose b. We choose b such that the one norm of w prime is bounded above by b. And remember w prime was this specific vector here. But in order to actually find what the one norm of w prime, w prime is, then we need this following norm inequality. So we need um, that the observable O, remember that it can be written in the Pauli basis, and it will be written as a sum of geometric local observables. And what we need is that the one norm of the Pauli coefficients can be bounded above by a constant times the spectral norm of O. So this is one of the reasons why we kind of wanted the spectral norm of O to be bounded above by one. Uh, so then this is bounded above by a constant. And we expect that this, this norm inequality could be used for you know, other learning theory tasks. Uh, it's something that's general. It's not specific to our, our setting, other than that O can be written as a sum of geometrically local observables. And oftentimes in learning theory, we do care a lot about the one norm of things. Uh, so we expect this could be useful in, in other settings as well. And so we need this in order to bound the one norm of W prime. And the way we prove this norm inequality is the following. So we know that for any quantum state, I call it sigma here, that trace O sigma is bounded above by the spectral norm of O. So then in order to prove this norm inequality, all that we need to do is show that there exists some state sigma such that the one norm of the Pauli coefficients is bounded above by some constant times trace O sigma. So that's exactly what we do in this proof. It's a little bit of a complicated construction, so I won't show it here, but we do exactly construct this state, sigma, such that this inequality holds. <coughs> and the final part of the proof is really just putting everything together. So remember in the first part, we showed that there is a simpler form for the ground state property that guarantees the existence of some hypothesis function that was the linear function over the feature space that has a low training error. So this linear function over the feature space approximates our ground state property well. And then using the norm inequality, then we can upper bound the one norm of W prime. And in doing that, then we'll get some B that scales as two to the poly log one over epsilon. And so then by the previous guarantee that I showed for, for lasso, which depended on B and the size of the feature space, if we also bound above the size of the feature space, which is very similar to the proof of this, um, then we just plug all of these things in into the standard learning theory bounds, and we get a sample complexity upper bound. Okay, so after the previous two parts of the proof, it really is kind of just a plug and chug into the, that theorem. So now I'll talk briefly about the numerical experiments. 
So for the numerical experiments, we consider this model. Uh, so it's a 2D random Heisenberg model, spins based on 2D lattice. And we have this, uh, the sum here is overall pairs of nearest neighbor qubits. And these Jij are the coupling terms. So in this case, the parameters that describe the Hamiltonian are just these Jij. And what we want to predict, like the ground state properties we want to predict, are two-body correlation functions. So we want to predict the expectation value of this. And so what we do in the numerical experiments is we actually use that corollary. So we use the corollary about predicting ground state representations instead of predicting ground states. So that way we can predict like many different two-body correlation functions while only generating this classical shadow train data once instead of for every single like two-body correlation function like regenerating it. So yeah, here we're using the, the classical shadow version. So we learn a ground state representation instead. And like I said before, there's also the adjustment about using random Fourier features, which are more robust in general and more um, widely used in practical machine learning. But we expect the same rigorous guarantees to hold. And this is seen in the numerical results. So here, the gray lines are what was done in the previous work. So Robert at all's work. And the blue line is our new algorithm. And so here we see on the x-axis, this is training set size, and on the y-axis, the average prediction error. And what we see is that as the training set size increases, we see a much steeper drop in the average prediction error. And this indicates the favorable scaling in terms of one over epsilon. So what's important here is that we can get um, a lower or the same um, we can get the same average prediction error with a much smaller training set size, or alternatively, we could get a much lower prediction error um, as well with a lower, with a more training data. And also on the right here, then we see a, a nice visualization of the learning algorithm. So here, this is predicting two body correlation function between qubit six and 11. And what we're, seeing here is how much really the, the coupling parameter was weighed in the machine learning algorithm, like how much it mattered in the final hypothesis function. And we see that as we would kind of expect, so the thickness and the darkness of the line here indicates that it was much more heavily weighted. And we see that between qubits six and 11, this parameter mattered the most, which is makes sense because we were predicting two body correlation functions for between qubits six and 11. And we see that a small region of parameters also kind of matters for the ML algorithm. And everything outside really didn't matter much at all. So this reflects our intuition about the learning algorithm that it really does leverage this like local structure. All right, I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, the improvement over the previous algorithm basically uh, to give you uh, Advantage in the number, in the number of samples, but not in the in the accuracy. Are you saying basically? Uh, you're basically saying this translates to to the size of the train set because the uh, same amount of trains will give you less less train less samples will give you the same accuracy, and so basically you're using the samples more efficiently. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit of both. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so we get this favorable scaling in terms of the number of samples, but the sample complexity for this algorithm is like uh, log n times two to the poly log one over epsilon. Whereas for the previous algorithm, it was n to the order one over epsilon. So the previous algorithm had this like exponential scaling in the prediction error, the one over epsilon. So but then here we have this quasi polynomial. Yeah, why, why is that? I mean, where, where, does this, where scaling, where, where is the scaling? Where is it? Got the better scaling in terms of the error. Yeah, so it, it comes kind of from this. And yeah, so it comes from this. So remember in the lasso guarantee, then there was this like B squared out front. That's this. Um, yeah, so, so this is B. And then in, in the lasso guarantee, of Yeah. But intuitively, why would you expect? A better error. I mean, each train in itself, each sample in itself, is so good for us because you're you're looking at the 
looking at but, uh, less parameters. Um, so I would expect I, I wouldn't expect a better behavior in terms of the error. It will just maybe maybe it's just that you need less less stuff. I don't know. I don't understand exactly the, the behavior in terms of the error. Yeah, I guess like the, the sample better represents, um, or I guess so. So the algorithm better makes use of the, each sample because it leverages like this local structure, um, and so it it kind of plays more into yeah like the yeah the local structure of the Hamiltonian instead of before where there was um, it was just like a general Hamiltonian and so it it couldn't use each sample as effectively. I guess it's kind of the intuition. How does the scaling from the theorem compare to what you see in the humanity experiments? Um, I don't think we analyze in particular like how how reflective. We just saw like the general trend follows what we would expect. It would be interesting to see because the theorem doesn't apply, right? So it would be interesting to see if you still get the same or even a better performance. Yeah, I guess, but the the same yeah the same essentially idea of the theorem would apply because the random Fourier features all that. All that matters here is that we can we can do like a Fourier approximation of these. But the theorem, such doesn't apply, right? The conditions yeah. just important. Yeah, so I think that's that's probably why we just looked at um this like yeah the, the general trend of it because also we're pushing like some, yeah. some constant factors and things in the theorem, so comparing it exactly is yeah. Um, yeah. So. so um, yeah, so we we show that we have some classical machine learning algorithm that can predict ground state properties with much less trained data than was previously you known. And this raises the hope that we can actually use these algorithms practically. So oftentimes when you run like a, an actual experiment, you would need to generate training data yeah, by doing like preparing the ground state in the lab and doing some measurements or something, or running like some simulation algorithm like DMRG, which takes a lot of time. And so in reality, we often can't generate a lot of training data very well. And so this yeah, raises the hope that we could actually use this practically since we require less training data. So there are some open questions. Um, one is, can quantum machine learning algorithms predict ground state properties even better? So we don't know if there exists a quantum advantage for this task yet. Um, another question is, any, are there any rigorous guarantees for neural network-based algorithms? So there's been a lot of work here in the, in the references about, um, about empirical evidence for, an, for a uh, good sample complexity scaling when you're using neural networks. And especially because neural networks are very popular these days in practical machine learning, this is something that we might care about. But no one's managed to actually prove a, a rigorous guarantee for this yet. And Another question is, can we predict other physical properties? So for example, like low energy excited states. And another one is, if we can generalize this work for any observable O. So before I had it, uh, O had to be the sum of geometrically local observables. Um, so could we get rid of that assumption? I think the main part where we need it is with the, the norm inequality. So I think that's, that's a part that I can identify where we definitely needed this assumption that O could be written as a sum of geometrically local observables, and we didn't really know how to prove it um, for general O. So, yeah, that's, that's all. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, any further questions? So, so it seems like the assumptions you need for your, your theorems are exactly also your assumptions in which uh, perturbation theory would work. If we do perturbation theory, we might remain what you call perturbation theory. And we look at the techniques that you use, these blocks of money, all these things that you want to use to, to see if you perturb some kind of phase, some kind of how the rate of conversion of perturbation theory. So, so, so are you sure that with perturbation theory, you cannot even do it more efficient than what you need, but because you will also get some linear dependence on your kind of terms that you like these small parameters and yeah. with, with the perturbation you can actually also calculate all these, these, these features all these expectation values in a pretty efficient way if you have like the if you know the the, the, the properties of one uh, of one ground state in the face so did you compare the, the resources needed for these your machine learning tasks versus doing perturbation theory um we didn't we didn't compare them directly and i haven't yeah i don't know yeah i'm not i'm not sure about that 
But don't you need more for perturbation theory to work? You need to know like all okay, the between different eigenstates. Wow. And it's not so you don't want the lowest order perturbation theory. Yeah, but so you can only do one order or something. Yeah, but it feels like she also limited. It's kind of limited. There's no yeah, system. Yeah, I think you do need more assumptions for perturbation. Yeah, without having access to this other information that we don't get. Maybe, maybe I don't know. That's why I was asking about it. Yeah, can you please put the, maybe the conditions again of the, of the theorem? Yeah, so this is this is the additional assumption here that each of the H J depend on constant number of parameters. Um, we also have the this one. It is more what you're wondering about. Okay. But what is missing in this in these assumptions is that it all has to be the same first in the parabolic. I think it's implicit because yeah. it says like gap time Hamiltonian within all x in, in, in the parameter space. Sorry? So, what what is this? I mean like it's it says it's gap time Hamiltonian uh, for all the x's in this minus one common one to the end. Mm -hmm. So there there is a path. Uh, there, there is an idiomatic path. Yeah, I guess I think we don't need to know this. Right, you don't need to yeah. know, but yeah, it exists. But, yeah. but it does prevent yeah, it from it. moving to a different place. Then if you have a perturbation that would not require, that would not be probabilistic. Right? If, if the perturbation method works. Well, if it's got that, you would expect that perturbation to work somewhere. Mm -hmm. But okay, I don't know, maybe you need more information, maybe. Yeah. A couple questions. One on the, on the next slide. When your assumption this is on the slide, sorry. Uh, yes. by the main theorem, yeah. Um, H sub J are you're assuming this is these are geometrically local on uh, and um, on finite dimensional bits. So doesn't this mean that every, I mean, there's only ever a finite number of parameters? Uh, it depends on, because there's just a finite number of matrix elements for each local term. Yeah, it's more like we, we don't want it to depend on like the entire parameter yeah. vector. Oh, uh, the, like uh, these matrix elements should not be a function of all of the parameters. Yeah, just a few. Yeah. Another question on your numerical examples. This Hamiltonian, I mean, yes, the Heisenberg interaction on a 2D square lattice with arbitrary coupling strengths is not only QMA hard, it's actually universal. So literally every phase of matter appears in the phase diagram of this as you vary the J sub IJ. And do you know that the particular point you were predicting around one third, right? Uh, you look like the, is this a gap? I would expect that this is small perturbations around this where you're changing each local coupling by a small amount, but independently. That the, this will drive it through phase. I mean, this will be very unstable. The spectral gap, even if it's gapped at this point. Did you check whether it is? It is even gapped at this point. If it is, is it gapped around it? But are the three small perturbations in each J separate? Um, we didn't check this, but I think because so okay. So I guess like the point of the numerical experiment is to show even like with. Even if it doesn't exactly satisfy some of the assumptions of the theorem, then it still works very well in practice. Uh, you went up to five by five, right? Uh, yeah, we went up to uh, like nine by five. In the but, um, yeah, five okay, by so five. everything's gapped for finite dimensions, and I don't know how quickly. I mean, this the, all of these hardness results are in the limit band very much, um, and where you know, you'd have the, the gap would, you'd expect to scale as one over poly n, but who knows what the constant is. Is there any clear about any computational but No, but this means that these this for this Hamiltonian, it's it's like this phase diagram is ridiculously complicated for this Hamiltonian. This thing is scatless. Come on. I mean, we can always talk about that the phase is scatless. Yes, right. OJ positive, this whole kind of octant or whatever is scatless. Even for finite ones. I mean, I mean this, this is right. completely outside of the scope of the theorem. 
Indeed, but not only that, this point is gapless, that's a good point, but also I think if you perturb each of the local things separately, you will go through phase transitions really easily. I mean, every, right. every direction you'll have a phase transition, I think. So I'm wondering if this works on this because it's just too small to see the fact that this is really, I mean, the gap, is it, what's numerically, what's the gap? So I think that's quite common in machine learning that methods work outside the scope of the theorems, right? That's my understanding. That's, that's very nice. That's surprising. <laughs> that's very surprising. And, and I think that this is, a, this is sort of the hardest Hamiltonian you could possibly theory. pick from a complexity theory perspective. Because this Hamiltonian is literally everything in physics. Is this sort of typical? Do you know that uh, typically it would be gapless and, uh, and all these things? I don't know, but it literally contains every, by this, because this Hamiltonian is universal, you can literally map every Hamiltonian. Whether, whether it's fine-tuned or is it typical? This comes down to the question whether you think that this go like it comes down to like this, what's the all QMA problems? How many are hard instances and I know, but it might it might be that that these these still it's, hold because it's not typical. Possibly, but if you believe the kind of like the stronger complexity kind of assumptions about the sort of the, the fact that it's MP can't be solved in polytype, you need to sort of resource band and measure stuff. And which, if you believe that similarly QMA, it's not that there's like one very zero measure set of hard instances, but like most of them are, which is a standard ish complexity assumption from the 90s. Then you would expect that the gapped and gapless phases of this Hamiltonian both have finite measure. So, what's, what's the standard complexity assumption on QMA? It's a little bit niche complexity assumption. On QMA, no, it's usually stated classically, but it's a fact that there's a way of formalizing the fact that you expect most MP. Um, right, but for QMA, do you. Uh, think I guess the same thing should hold. I, I, don't, I don't know okay. if it's a typical thing. I mean, I mean it's, it's a conjecture that none of this is proven, but. Surprising if um, we would measure one set of instances of QMA were solvable in, in yeah. right. I think the hard instances will not be very likely at all. If you choose these coefficients at random, many instances will be easy. I don't know. I think they might be measure, positive measure then. Well, that might be the small measure. Yeah. But then are these, these easy because this is a spin glass and all of the, I mean, everything just looks locally like a max nice mixed state? I mean, are these, is this easy because for a typical instance of this, this is a spin glass, the locally everything looks extremely random and close to Most nice instances don't have super right? Probably look at and small this should, But this would make the local observables easy to predict, right? Because it would be interesting to compare to what happens when you just move. You take a small cluster and you kind of cut the best and right? see what happens. I mean, it's a plus thing. I'm very surprised that this works for this model. <laughs> So yeah, like um, in the previous work, and they also did this, and I don't think that it, um, I remember they they also said like even if it doesn't have a phase, uh, like in within one phase, then um, yeah, like the point of the numerical experiments is show that even if like the exact assumptions don't hold, then like maybe we expect them to, or maybe they they will. Um, Maybe it's for a different reason, but the, I mean, locally this is looking like, you know, this is highly entangled, this is a spin glass, and you're right, so the few body density matrices probably just don't vary very much. Like, all of a sudden you've got short range correlations. The J and J that you chose here is plus one, minus one, or uh, anywhere between zero and two, so not negative, so it's Okay. It'll be interesting to see this for something like transverse icing, where all your you're just good looking at where you know that there's a rather than these glassy things where you have an ordered and disordered phase and can it predict through that phase transition, which is what I understand. I just want to make a comment about the question of typicality of the hardware. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that the intuition that comes from typicality of anti hardness should go forward to the QMA hardness because. Obviously, it should go forward for any hardness, yeah. but it could be that the typicality of, you know, the hardness of the extra hardness of QMA compared to NP is not does not behave in could a similar way, and that it needs to be fine tuned to get the full QMA hardness. I think I think this is a very important question in general. But, but again, what would be the concern? The method could fail with a finite probability of the one that measures the only is that the statement that if there's hard instances of measure non zero? Yes. Uh, which could be the case. It's, it's hard to see that numerically, I guess. Yes. Even for big instances, imagine the thing has a super small measure, how many find them mm -hmm. really work hard. Uh, 
So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be good to defer to the coffee, which is cooling down. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.